Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to two new members of our Patreon family, Ashley and Joy. Thank you so much to both of you for supporting this podcast and helping it stay an ad-free space of relaxation for everyone. And because you joined Patreon in August, you'll both be entered in our monthly raffle. This month, the prize is a three-month free subscription to Libro.fm, which includes three free audiobooks. If you are interested in becoming a member of Patreon or supporting this podcast through a one-time tip with no subscription required at buymeacoffee.com, you'll find links to both of those in the show description. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight we're relaxing with science and a book written by one of the most remarkable women of her time, Margaret Cavendish, who was not only a scientist, but one of the originators of science fiction. Tonight we're reading from her work, Grounds of Natural Philosophy, divided into 13 parts, with an appendix containing five parts. The second edition, much altered from the first, which went under the name of Philosophical and Physical Opinions, written by the thrice noble, illustrious, and excellent princess, the Duchess of Newcastle, printed by A. Maxwell in the year 1668. Let's begin. To all the universities in Europe, most learned societies, all books without exception, being undoubtedly under your jurisdiction, it is very strange that some authors of good note are not ashamed to repine at it. And the more forward they are in judging others, the less liberty they will allow to be judged themselves. But if there was not a necessity, yet I would make it my choice to submit willingly to your censures these grounds of natural philosophy, in hopes that you will not condemn them because they want art, if they be found fraught with sense and reason. You are the stars of the first magnitude, whose influence governs the world of learning, and it is my confidence that you will be propitious to the birth of this beloved child of my brain, whom I take the boldness to recommend to your patronage. And as if you vouchsafe to look on it favorably, I shall be extremely obliged to your goodness for its everlasting life. So, if you resolve to frown upon it, I beg the favor that it be not buried in the hard and rocky grave of your displeasure, but be suffered by your gentle silence to lie still in the soft and easy bed of oblivion which is incomparably the less punishment of the two. It is so commonly the error of indulgent parents to spoil their children out of fondness that I may be forgiven for spoiling this in never putting it to suck at the breast of some learned nurse whom I might have got from among your students to have assisted me, but would obstinately suckle it myself and bring it up alone without the help of any scholar. Which having caused in the first edition, which was published under the name of Philosophical and Physical Opinions, many imperfections, I have endeavored in this second, by many alterations and additions, which have forced me to give it another name, to correct them. 
whereby I fear my faults are rather changed and increased than amended. If you expect fair proportions in the parts, and a beautiful symmetry in the whole, having never been taught at all, and having read but little, I acknowledge myself too illiterate to afford it, and too impatient to labor much for method. But if you will be contented with pure wit and the effects of mere contemplation, I hope that somewhat of that kind may be found in this book, and in my other philosophical, poetical, and oratorical works, all which I leave, and this especially, to your kind protection, and am your most humble servant and admirer, Margaret Newcastle. Grounds of Natural Philosophy The First Part Chapter 1 Of Matter Matter is that we name body, which matter cannot be less or more than body. Yet some learned persons are of opinion that there are substances that are not material bodies, but how they can prove any sort of substance to be no body, I cannot tell. Neither can any of nature's parts express it, because a corporeal part cannot have an incorporeal perception. But as for matter, there may be degrees, as more pure or less pure. But there cannot be any substances in nature that are between body and no body. Also, matter cannot be figureless, neither can matter be without parts. Likewise, there cannot be matter without place, nor place without matter. So that matter, figure, or place is but one thing. For it is as impossible for one body to have two places, as for one place to have two bodies. Neither can there be place without body. Chapter 2 of motion. Though matter might be without motion, yet motion cannot be without matter, for it is impossible, in my opinion, that there should be an immaterial motion in nature. And if motion is corporeal, then matter, figure, place, and motion is but one thing, viz. a corporeal figurative motion. As for a first motion, I cannot conceive how it can be, or what that first motion should be, for an immaterial cannot have a material motion, or so strong a motion as to set all the material parts in nature or this world a-moving. But, in my opinion, every particular part moves by its own motion. If so, then all the actions in nature are self-corporeal, figurative motions. But this is to be noted, that as there is but one matter, so there is but one motion, and as there are several parts of matter, so there are several changes of motion. For as matter, of what degree soever it is, or can be, is but matter, so motion, although it make infinite changes, can be but motion. Chapter 3 Of the Degrees of Matter Though matter can be neither more nor less than matter, yet there may be degrees of matter, as more pure or less pure. And yet, the purest parts are as much material in relation to the nature of matter as the grossest. Neither can there be more than two sorts of matter, namely that sort which is self-moving and that which is not self-moving. Also, there can be but two sorts of the self-moving parts, 
as that sort that moves entirely without burdens, and that sort that moves with the burdens of those parts that are not self-moving, so that there can be but these three sorts. Those parts that are not moving, those that move free, and those that move with those parts that are not moving of themselves. Which degrees are, in my opinion, the rational parts, the sensitive parts, and the inanimate parts? Which three sorts of parts are so joined that they are but as one body? For it is impossible that those three sorts of parts should subsist single by reason nature is but one united material body. Chapter 4 Of Vacuum In my opinion, there cannot possibly be any vacuum. For though nature as being material is divisible and compoundable, and having self-motion is in perpetual action, Yet nature cannot divide or compose from herself, although she may move, divide, and compose in herself. But were it possible, nature's parts could wander and stray in and out of vacuum, there would be a confusion, for where unity is not, order cannot be. Wherefore, by the order and method of nature's corporeal actions, we may perceive there is no vacuum. For what needs a vacuum, when as body and place is but one thing, and as the body alters, so doth the place. Chapter 5 The Difference of the Two Self-Moving Parts of Matter the self-moving parts of nature seem to be of two sorts or degrees, one being pure and so more agile and free than the other, which, in my opinion, are the rational parts of nature. The other sort is not so pure and are the architectonical parts, which are the laboring parts, bearing the grosser materials about them which are the inanimate parts. And this sort, in my opinion, are the sensitive parts of nature, which form, build, or compose themselves with the inanimate parts into all kinds and sorts of creatures, as animals, vegetables, minerals, elements, or what creatures soever there are in nature. Whereas the rational are so pure that they cannot be so strong laborers as to move with burdens of inanimate parts, but move freely without burdens. For though the rational and sensitive with the inanimate move together as one body, yet the rational and sensitive do not move as one part, as the sensitive doth with the inanimate. But pray mistake me not when I say the inanimate parts are grosser, as if I meant they were like some dense creature, for those are but effects and not causes. But I mean gross, dull, heavy parts, as that they are not self-moving, nor do I mean by purity or rarity, but agility. For rare or dense parts are effects and not causes. And therefore, if any should ask whether the rational and sensitive parts were rare or dense, I answer, they may be rare or dense, according as they contract or dilate their parts. For there is no such thing as a single part in nature. For matter or body cannot be so divided, but that it will remain matter which is divisible. Chapter 6 Of Dividing and Uniting of Parts 
Though every self-moving part or corporeal motion have free will to move after what manner they please, yet by reason there can be no single parts, several parts unite in one action, and so there must be united actions. For though every particular part may divide from particular parts, yet those that divide from some are necessitated to join with other parts at the same point of time of division, and at that very same time is their uniting or joining, so that division and composition or joining is as one and the same act. Also, every altered action is an altered figurative place, by reason matter, figure, motion, and place is but one thing, and by reason nature is a perpetual motion, she must of necessity cause infinite varieties. Chapter 7 Of Life and Knowledge All the parts of nature have life and knowledge, but all the parts have not active life and a perceptive knowledge, but only the rational and sensitive. And this is to be noted, that the variousness or variety of actions causes varieties of lives and knowledges. For as the self-moving parts alter or vary their actions, so they alter and vary their lives and knowledges, but there cannot be an infinite particular knowledge, nor an infinite particular life, because matter is divisible and compoundable. Chapter 8 Of Nature's Knowledge and Perception If nature were not self-knowing, self-living, and also perceptive, she would run into confusion, for there could be neither order nor method in ignorant motion. Neither would there be distinct kinds or sorts of creatures, nor such exact and methodical varieties as there are, for it is impossible to make orderly and methodical distinctions or distinct orders by chances. Wherefore, nature being so exact as she is, must needs be self-knowing and perceptive. And though all her parts, even the inanimate parts, are self-knowing and self-living, yet only her self-moving parts have an active life and a perceptive knowledge. Chapter 9 Of Perception in General Perception is a sort of knowledge that hath reference to objects, that is, some parts to know other parts. But yet objects are not the cause of perception, for the cause of perception is self-motion. But some would say, if there were no object, there could be no perception. I answer, it is true, for that cannot be perceived, that is not. But yet corporeal motions cannot be without parts, and so not without perception. But put an impossible case, as that there could be a single corporeal motion and no more in nature. That corporeal motion may make several changes, somewhat like conceptions, although not perceptions. But nature, being corporeal, is composed of parts, and therefore there cannot be a want of objects. But there are infinite several manners and ways of perception, which proves that the objects are not the cause for every several kind and sort of creatures have several kinds and sorts of perception according to the nature and property of such a kind or sort of composition. 
as makes such a kind or sort of creature, as I shall treat of more fully in the following parts of this book. Chapter 10 of Double Perception There is a double perception in nature, the rational perception and the sensitive. The rational perception is more subtle and penetrating than the sensitive. Also, it is more generally perceptive than the sensitive. Also, it is a more agile perception than the sensitive. All which is occasioned not only through the purity of the rational parts, but through the liberty of the rational parts, whereas the sensitive being encumbered with the inanimate parts, is obstructed and retarded. Yet all perceptions, both sensitive and rational, are in parts. But by reason the rational is freer, being not a painful laborer, can more easily make a united perception than the sensitive, which is the reason the rational parts can make a whole perception of a whole object, whereas the sensitive makes but perceptions in part of one and the same object. Chapter 11 Whether the triumphant parts can be perceived distinctly from each other. Some may make this question, whether the three sorts of parts the rational, sensitive, and inanimate may be singly perceived. I answer, not unless there were single parts in nature. But though they cannot be singly perceived, yet they singly perceive, because every part hath its own motion, and so its own perception. And though those parts that have not self-motion have not perception, yet being joined as one body to the sensitive, they may, by the sensitive motion, have some different sorts of self-knowledge, caused by the different actions of the sensitive parts, but that is not perception. But as I said, the triumphant parts cannot be perceived distinctly asunder, though their actions may be different. For the joining or intermixing of parts hinders not the several actions. As, for example, a man is composed of several parts, or, as the learned term them, corporeal motions. Yet not any of those different parts or corporeal motions are a hindrance to each other. The same between the sensitive and rational parts. Chapter 12 Whether nature can know herself, or have an absolute power of herself, or have an exact figure. I was of an opinion that nature, because infinite, could not know herself, because infinite hath no limit. Also, that nature could not have an absolute power over her own parts, because she had infinite parts, and that the infiniteness did hinder the absoluteness. But since I have considered that the infinite parts must of necessity be self-knowing, and that those infinite self-knowing parts are united in one infinite body, by which nature must have both a united knowledge and a united power. Also, I questioned whether nature could have an exact figure. But mistake me not, for I do not mean the figure of matter, but a composed figure of parts, because nature was composed of infinite variety of figurative parts. But considering that those infinite varieties of infinite figurative parts were united into one body, I did conclude that she must needs have an exact figure, though she be infinite. 
as, for example, this world is composed of numerous and several figurative parts, and yet the world hath an exact form and frame, the same which it would have if it were infinite. But as for self-knowledge and power, certainly God hath given them to nature, though her power be limited, for she cannot move beyond her nature nor hath she power to make herself any otherwise than what she is, since she cannot create or annihilate any part or particle, nor can she make any of her parts immaterial, or any immaterial corporeal, nor can she give to one part the nature, viz. the knowledge, life, motion, or perception of another part, which is the reason one creature cannot have the properties or faculties of another. They may have the like, but not the same. Chapter 13 Nature Cannot Judge Herself Although nature knows herself and hath a free power of herself, I mean a natural knowledge and power, yet nature cannot be an upright and just judge of herself, and so not of any of her parts, because every particular part is a part of herself. Besides, as she is self-moving, she is self-changing, and so she is alterable. Wherefore, nothing can be a perfect and a just judge, but something that is individable and unalterable, which is the infinite God, who is unmoving, immutable, and so unalterable, who is the judge of the infinite corporeal actions of his servant nature. And this is the reason that all nature's parts appeal to God, as being the only judge. Chapter 14 Nature Poises or Balances Her Actions Although nature be infinite, yet all her actions seem to be poised or balanced by opposition. As, for example, as nature hath dividing, so composing actions. Also, as nature hath regular, so irregular actions. As nature hath dilating, so contracting actions. In short, we may perceive amongst the creatures or parts of this world, slow, swift, thick, thin, heavy, light, rare, dense, little, big, low, high, broad, narrow, light, dark, hot, cold, productions, dissolutions, peace, war, mirth, sadness, and that we name life and death, and infinite the like, as also infinite varieties in every several kind and sort of actions. But the infinite varieties are made by the self-moving parts of nature, which are the corporeal figurative motions of nature. Chapter 15 whether there be degrees of corporeal strength. As I have declared, there are, in my opinion, two sorts of self-moving parts, the one sensitive, the other rational. The rational parts of my mind, moving in the manner of conception or inspection, did occasion some disputes or arguments amongst those parts of my mind. The arguments were these, whether there were degrees of strength, as there was of purity, between their own sort, as the rational and the sensitive. 
the major part of the argument was that self-motion could be but self-motion, for not any part of nature could move beyond its powers of self-motion. But the minor part argued that the self-motion of the rational might be stronger than the self-motion of the sensitive. But the major part was of the opinion that there could be no degrees of the power of nature or the nature of nature. For matter which was nature could be but self-moving or not self-moving or partly self-moving or not self-moving. But the miner argued that it was not against the nature of matter to have degrees of corporeal strength as well as degrees of purity. For though there could not be degrees of purity amongst the parts of the same sort, as amongst the parts of the rational, or amongst the parts of the sensitive, yet if there were degrees of the rational and sensitive parts, there might be degrees of strength. The major part said that if there were degrees of strength, it would make confusion, by reason there would be no agreement for the strongest would be tyrants to the weakest, insomuch as they would never suffer those parts to act methodically or regularly. But the minor part said that they had observed that there were degrees of strength among the sensitive parts. The major part argued that they had not degrees of strength by nature, but that the greater number of parts were stronger than a less number of parts. But through the manner and form of their compositions or productions. Thus my thoughts argued, but after many debates and disputes, at last my rational parts agreed that if there were degrees of strength, it could not be between the parts of the same degree or sort but between the rational and sensitive, and if so, the sensitive was stronger, being less pure, and the rational was more agile, being more pure. Chapter 16 Of Effects and Cause To treat of infinite effects produced from an infinite cause is an endless work, and impossible to be performed or effected. Only this may be said, that the effects, though infinite, are so united to the material cause as that not any single effect can be, nor no effect can be annihilated, by reason all effects are in the power of the cause. But this is to be noted, that some effects producing other effects are, in some sort or manner, a cause. Chapter 17 Of Influence An influence is this, when as the corporeal figurative motions in different kinds and sorts of creatures or in one and the same sorts or kinds, move sympathetically. And though there be antipathetical motions, as well as sympathetical, yet all the infinite parts of matter are agreeable in their nature, as being all material and self-moving. And by reason there is no vacuum, there must of necessity be an influence amongst all the parts of nature. Chapter 18 Of Fortune and Chance Fortune is only various corporeal motions of several creatures, designed to one creature or more creatures either to that creature or those creatures, advantage or disadvantage. If advantage, man names it good fortune. If disadvantage, man names it ill fortune. As for chance, 
it is the visible effects of some hidden cause, and fortune a sufficient cause to produce such effects. For the conjunction of sufficient causes doth produce such or such effects, which effects could not be produced if any of those causes were wanting, so that chances are but the effects of fortune. Chapter 19 of Time and Eternity Time is not a thing by itself, nor is time immaterial, for time is only the variations of corporeal motions. But eternity depends not on motion, but of a being without beginning or ending. The Second Part Chapter 1 Of Creatures All creatures are composed figures by the consent of associating parts, by which association they join into such or such a figured creature. And though every corporeal motion or self-moving part hath its own motion, Yet by their association they all agree in proper actions, as actions proper to their compositions. And if every particular part hath not a perception of all the parts of their association, yet every part knows its own work. Chapter 2 Of Knowledge and Perception of Different Kinds and Sorts of Creatures there is not any creature in nature that is not composed of self-moving parts, viz. both of rational and sensitive, as also of the inanimate parts, which are self-knowing, so that all creatures being composed of these sorts of parts must have a sensitive and rational knowledge and perception, as animals, vegetables, minerals, elements, or what else there is in nature. But several kinds and several sorts in these kinds of creatures, being composed after different manners and ways, must needs have different lives, knowledges, and perceptions. And not only every several kind and sort have such differences, but every particular creature, through the variations of their self-moving parts, have varieties of lives, knowledges, perceptions, conceptions, and the like. And not only so, but every particular part of one and the same creature have varieties of knowledges and perceptions, because they have varieties of actions. But, as I have declared, there is not any different kind of creature that can have the like life, knowledge, and perception, not only because they have different productions and different forms, but different natures as being of different kinds. Chapter 3 of Perception of Parts and United Perception all the self-moving parts are perceptive, and all perception is in parts and is dividable and compoundable, as being material, also alterable as being self-moving. Wherefore, no creature that is composed or consists of many several sorts of corporeal figurative motions, but must have many sorts of perception, which is the reason that one creature, as man, cannot perceive another man any otherwise but in parts. For the rational and sensitive, nay, all the parts of one and the same creature, perceive their adjoining parts, as they perceive foreign parts, only by their close conjunction and near relation they unite in one and the same actions. 
I do not say they always agree, for when they move irregularly, they disagree. And some of those united parts will move after one manner, and some after another. But when they move regularly, then they move to one and the same design, or one and the same united action. So although a creature is composed of several sorts of corporeal motions, yet these several sorts, being properly united in one creature, move all agreeably to the property and nature of the whole creature. That is, the particular parts move according to the property of the whole creature, because the particular parts, by conjunction, make the whole so that the several parts make one whole, by which a whole creature hath both a general knowledge and a knowledge of parts, whereas the perceptions of foreign objects are but in the parts, and this is the reason why one creature perceives not the whole of another creature, but only some parts. Yet this is to be noted, that not any part hath another part's nature or motion, nor therefore their knowledge or perception, but by agreement and unity of parts, there is composed perceptions. Chapter 4 Whether the rational and sensitive parts have a perception of each other. Some may ask the question, whether the rational and sensitive have perception of each other. I answer, in my opinion they have. For though the rational and sensitive parts be of two sorts, yet both sorts have self-motion, so that they are but as one, as that they are both corporeal motions. And had not the sensitive parts encumbrances, they would be, in a degree, as agile and as free as the rational. But though each sort hath perception of each other, and some may have the like, yet they have not the same, for not any part can have another's perception or knowledge. But by reason the rational and sensitive are both corporeal motions, there is a strong sympathy between those sorts in one conjunction, or creature. Indeed, the rational parts are the designing parts, and the sensitive the laboring parts, and the inanimate are as the material parts. Not but all the three sorts are material parts, but the inanimate, being not self-moving, are the burdensome parts. Chapter 5 Of Thoughts and the Whole Mind of a Creature As for thoughts, though they are several corporeal motions or self-moving parts, yet being united by conjunction in one creature into one whole mind cannot be perceived by some parts of another creature, nor by the same sort of creature as by another man. But some may ask whether the whole mind of one creature, as the whole mind of one man, may not perceive the whole mind of another man. I answer that if the mind was not joined and mixed with the sensitive and inanimate parts, and had not interior as well as exterior parts, the whole mind of one man might perceive the whole mind of another man. But that not being possible, one whole mind cannot perceive another whole mind. By which observation we may perceive there are no platonic lovers in nature. But some may ask whether the sensitive parts can perceive the rational in one and the same creature. I answer, they do, for if they did not, it were impossible for the sensitive parts to execute the rational designs, so that what the mind designs 
the sensitive body doth put in execution as far as they have power. But if through irregularities the body be sick and weak, or hath some infirmities, they cannot execute the designs of the mind. Chapter 6 Whether the Mind of One Creature Can Perceive the Mind of Another Creature Some may ask the reason why one creature as man cannot perceive the thoughts of another man as well as he perceives his exterior sensitive parts. I answer that the rational parts of one man perceive as much of the rational parts of another man as the sensitive parts of that man doth of the sensitive parts of the other man, that is, as much as is presented to his perception. For all creatures, and every part and particle, have those three sorts of matter, and therefore every part of a creature is perceiving and perceived. But by reason all creatures are composed of parts, both of the rational and sensitive, all perceptions are in parts, as well the rational as the sensitive perception. Yet neither the rational nor the sensitive can perceive all the interior parts or corporeal motions unless they were presented to their perception. Neither can one part know the knowledge and perception of another part. But what parts of one creature are subject to the perception of another creature, those are perceived. Chapter 7 of Perception and Conception Although the exterior parts of one creature can but perceive the exterior parts of another creature, yet the rational can make conceptions of the interior parts, but not perception. For neither the sense nor reason can perceive what is not present, but by rote, as after the manner of conceptions or remembrances, as I shall in my following chapters declare, so that the exterior rational parts that are with the exterior sensitive parts of an object are as much perceived the one as the other. But those exterior parts of an object, not moving in particular parties, as in the whole creature, is the cause that some parts of one creature cannot perceive the whole composition or frame of another creature. That is, some of the rational parts of one creature cannot perceive the whole mind of another creature, the like of the sensitive parts. Chapter 8 of Human Suppositions Although nature hath an infinite knowledge and perception, yet being a body and therefore divisible and compoundable, and having also self-motion to divide and compound her infinite parts after infinite several manners, is the reason that her finite parts or particular creatures cannot have a general or infinite knowledge, being limited by being finite to finite perceptions or perceptive knowledge, which is the cause of suppositions or imaginations concerning foreign objects. As for example, a man can but perceive the exterior parts of another man or any other creature that is subject to human perception. Yet his rational parts may suppose or presuppose what another man thinks, or what he will act. And for other creatures, a man may suppose or imagine what the innate nature of such a vegetable or mineral or element is, and may imagine or suppose the moon to be another world, and that all the fixed stars are suns, which suppositions man names conjectures. Chapter 9 of Information Between Several Creatures 
No question but there is information between all creatures. But several sorts of creatures having several sorts of informations, it is impossible for any particular sort to know or have perceptions of the infinite or numberless informations between the infinite and numberless parts or creatures of nature. Nay, there are so many several informations amongst one sort as of mankind that it is impossible for one man to perceive them all. No, nor can one man generally perceive the particular informations that are between the particular parts of his sensitive body or between the particular informations of his rational body or between the particular rational and sensitive parts. Much less can man perceive or know the several informations of other creatures. Chapter 10 The Reason of Several Kinds and Sorts of Creatures Some may ask why there are such sorts of creatures as we perceive there are and not other sorts. I answer that tis probable we do not perceive all the several kinds and sorts of creatures in nature. In truth, it is impossible, if nature be infinite, for a finite to perceive the infinite varieties of nature. Also, they may ask why the planets are of a spherical shape and human creatures are of an upright shape and beasts of a bending and stooping shape. Also, why birds are made to fly and not beasts. And for what cause or design have animals and vegetables and minerals and elements such and such shapes and properties. I answer that several sorts, kinds and differences of particulars causes order. By reason it causes distinctions, for if all creatures were alike, it would cause a confusion. Chapter 11 Of the Several Properties of Several Kinds and Sorts of Creatures As I have said, there are several kinds and several sorts and several particular creatures of several kinds and sorts, whereof there are some creatures of a mixed kind, and some of a mixed sort, and some of a mixture of some particulars. Also, there are some kind of creatures and sorts of creatures, as also particulars of a dense nature, others of a rare nature, some of a light nature, some of a heavy nature, some of a bright nature, some of a dark nature, some of an ascending nature, some of a descending nature, some of a hard nature, some of a soft nature, some of a loose nature, and some of a fixed nature, some of an agile nature, and some of a slow nature some of a consistent nature, and some of a dissolving nature, all which is according to the frame and form of their society or composition. And with that, we reach the end of part two of Grounds of Natural Philosophy by Margaret Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle which seems as good a place to stop as any. Reading that, I can definitely understand why science used to be called philosophy. If you'd like to read this fascinating work for yourself, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook version from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you have a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at BoringBooksPod, or drop me an email on our website, www.boringbookspod.com. I always love hearing from you. 
I'm so glad you could join me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.